the sound of that. That's what the Taxpayer Association is all about. Uh, I just found out we, we have to be out of here tonight uh, by 10 o'clock. Uh, so I'd like to get the main speaker up here right now. Uh, he's agreed to give us an hour presentation and then open it up for questions. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce Mark Cornkey. Okay, good evening. Bob, are you available? Sir, would you please retire the colors that are standing in the room? Thank you. First of all, my name is Mark Kornke, K-O-E-R-N-K-E. -E. It is the 16th of November, do I have the date right? 1993. One day closer to victory and driving the foreign forces that are occupying our land from the United States. We will win. First of all, I'd like to explain the fact that I requested the flag that was sitting at the front of this room retired. The flag that you were seeing before you was an admiralty flag. We are constitutionalists here. Any room in which the gold flag is flying is under British admiralty law, not under U.S. constitutional law. If you're not familiar with it nor believe that those formalities are important, then you should be able to donate a flag of proper configuration to this room. As a constitutionalist, we believe in the original form of government of the United States, Constitution Bill of Rights, and that it be implemented and constantly adhered to. Now, a few questions I'd like to ask, because of course we always start out with interesting props to kind of get you uh, awake, first thing in a meeting like this. How many of you have your liberty teeth? How many possess them? As Jefferson said, your liberty teeth, the firearms and the capability to use them, the knowledge and the will to do so. Now a lot of you, let's see those hands again, would say that these are Liberty Teeth. This is Automat Kalishnikov, AK-47. However, I brought another one along tonight. You know, remember that, that kicks box I showed you in one of the other meetings? I got a much better one here. Now, I did some basic math the other day, not New, Wor New World Order math, and I found that using the old-style math, you can get about four politicians for 120 foot of rope. <laughs> By the way, DuPont made this very fitting that one of the New World Order crowd should uh, provide us with the resources to liberate our nation. It is 716 three-strand green line, 120 foot normal use for repelling. Remember, whenever using this stuff, always try and find a willow tree. The entertainment will last longer. Why do I say use that? Well, I have a little thing here that everybody should start to possess and carry with them at all times. At every meeting, I demand that you do so, if at all possible, find one. Make one, photocopy one. That's right. How many have it here? Whoop, see? Now, in our last meeting, or the last meeting that I spoke at, and I will read this again, for yet another one will be violated shortly. He has erected a multitude of new offices and sent hither swarms of officers to harass our people and eat out their substance. He has kept among us in times of peace standing armies without the consent of the legislatures. He is affected to render the military independent of and superior to the civil power, the New World Order Police and the National Police Force. He has combined with others to subject us to a jurisdiction foreign to our Constitution and unacknowledged by our laws, giving his assent to their acts of pretended legislation. And if you do not think that that is, happen is not happening right now, I suggest you, you spend two hours with C-SPAN or CNN. 
I suggest you listen to the enemy now, for they are gloating at the possibility of sinking their claws into the corpse that was America. We're quartering large, large bodies of armed troops among us, and the use of them, Waco, Texas, Ruby Creek, and a variety of other places that we may not even know of yet. This applies because you just saw it. For protecting them by a mock trial for, from punishment for any murders which they should commit on the inhabitants of these states. You need only watch the hearings, the mock hearings concerning the attacks on Waco. For imposing taxes on us without our consent. Anybody here in favor of the last tax? I don't see any hands. For depriving us, in many cases, of the benefits of trial by jury. Why the flag was retired here, British Admiralty Law. You are guilty until proven innocent. Forfeiture and seizure laws. As they exist and are being used today are in direct violation of the Constitution of the United States. For transporting us beyond seas to be tried for pretended offenses. People, if you do not understand the New World Order and the World Court, you shall soon learn. And if you think you are going to be tried by, quote, unquote, your peers, well, in the UN's eyes, you will be. Somebody who may not even speak English. For taking away our charters, abolishing our most valuable laws, and altering fundamentally the forms of our government. NAFTA, you'd better read it. The New World Order, absolutely. He has plundered our seas, ravaged our coasts, burnt our towns, and destroyed the lives of our people. If the New World Order takes charge, that is but an epitaph. What am I reading from? Declaration of Independence, 4th of July, 1776. Your enemies are versed well in your demise. They will slap you in the face constantly. And in fact, if you'll notice, what I am doing here is they are going to systematically take your Constitution, your Bill of Rights, I didn't even start on this page, your Declaration of Independence, and turn it upside down. Why? Because the people that you are facing, we have been fighting for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Once our enemy succeeds, those who are controlling the New World Order, they will bring in socialism. As Orwell said, the boot on the face of humanity forever. But that won't last forever. Your real enemies are the monarchists and the people of title and nobility whom we broke away from when we wrote this document. House of Windsor, House Rothschild, Habsburg, the new Rockefellers. There is a long, long list. That's why I have a lot of long, long rope. Might have to get a longer one. I'll probably wear this one out. You're right. That's why DuPont made a lot more, and then we'll go to the constitutional, constitutional material, hemp. Okay? Now, have they been successful? Yes, for we have been asleep. Will they win? We shall grind them into the earth before they grind us into dust. <laughs> the punishment for the actions that they have committed is high treason. Treachery most foul. Acts against our people that the Founding Fathers thought were so horrendous that they wrote down for posterity so that not only their enemy would name it. What will we lose? Sovereignty and freedom. Now, some people say that's not important. Well, that's good. Then go to that other land that you wish to seek. 
An interesting thing that I've been calculating for a while, and I believe is something you're going to have to etch into your memories, for I may fall in this conflict and, in fact, anticipate the possibility. As Lindsay Williams said, though, what are you going to threaten me with, heaven? We have nothing to lose and everything to gain, for we are criminals in the very land that we created. Your property is forfeit to taxes. Your children are forfeit to the government as chattel or property. Your future is sold by the people that you sent into government who were supposed to govern, not rule. You have nothing to lose and everything to gain. For now, it is only up. Oh, we could sink a tad lower, but drowning is not my preference. For that reason, we are going to have to organize, plan, or as we say, educate, equip, and engage, and engage, and engage again. How will they affect us? Well, that old Hegelian principle of demonstrate the problem after you've created it, of course, and then finally have the solution, which you fabricated, is obviously quite apparent both with NAFTA, with the new firearms laws that are going to be taking effect very shortly, which will make you all criminals, of course. We're, that is right. Many laws are in motion right now, and the mission of them is to create confusion. Step back and pay attention to the whole forest as one, one picture. As an enemy equipped with many tendrils, capable of attacking us on many fronts, we must attack the whole. Playing little Dutch boy isn't going to work. One finger here, one finger here, a toe here. After a while, we lose. We cannot afford to be on the defensive in all areas. Oh, we will have to for a while. But in the initial stage, with the actions that are taking place now, we are going to have to strike. The gentleman here, I agree, said they are not listening to us in Washington. You are right. They are not. They have isolated themselves. They have insulated themselves. But for that reason, that will also be their demise. For while they have been insulated, we have been in motion. Our hand now reaches across the entire nation in organization. The people are disgruntled. Our earlier speaker, I cannot emphasize this enough, the people are being feared to be disgruntled so that your enemy can rise up with its own source, its own individual, and take the initiative if they stumble with this one. Watch this hand. Slap. They are looking for insurance policies because even now they hesitate as they are close to victory, as the hand reaches to grasp the ring, as I have said before. And if you don't think they're worried, take a look at the rapidity with which they are striking now. The actions are... They're not one here, one there. They realize that like a boxer in the middle rounds, he has to pepper his opponent with a variety of injuries wear him out, and then, with one decisive blow to a key position, shatter the opponent's capability to defend. Do not let them run you ragged in any way, shape, or form. Concentrate. Focus. Strike hard against a specific target. Destroy it. You must start to think of things in military terms. Your enemy is thinking in military terms. Why do you think they are going after the weapons? Because they know full well that all that they are doing, as it says right here, and I will repeat it again, giving his assent to their acts of pretended legislation. Will it be legal? No. Will it have the color of law? Yes. They're always worried about their place in history. Always for they can never be fully sure. There's always that tug of anxiety at the back of the coat, the not knowing for sure where the next knife is. This is the key. We have the proper tool in the proper place at the proper time. 
More patriots than they can count, more people than they can find. Kill me and a hundred replace me now. Kill me today and with what I already know and what I've already seen. As I said, I pity them for we cannot stop them. I would hope that many of us would regulate the actions that take place. But I do not think that it will be possible once things start. A world of misery and a lifetime of hurt are coalescing to a nexus right now, a boiling point. You can all feel it and you can all see it. The time of great anxiety, the gnashing of teeth, that was intentionally created. There's no accident to this. If our forces are to be successful, should we stand on the sidelines and simply talk? No. But should we talk? Yes. Why? I thoroughly believe in a Heavenly Father up above, and I pray every day that this will not happen, knowing full well that it will anyway. And that if it does happen, I grant that God give us the strength for total victory, and that I should at least be given the opportunity, if, if not to, both, to live as just a free man, but also, if need be, die as a free man, to preserve the freedom of my children. And I know full well that the other side will lose. That is guaranteed. But it's a matter of effort. When I stand before my Creator, there are a lot of questions that are going to be asked of all of us. And the first thing that's going to be asked is, did you do everything in your power? Did you do everything in your power? And I will be able to say quite honestly, yes, I did. You all need to stand now. These seats aren't full enough. The lines outside of their domiciles is not long enough. Outside of these buildings, outside of these halls, is not long enough. These rooms at the political end should be stuffed to capacity. Will they listen to you? No, they will, they will leave. They will go to quiet chambers. They shall plot behind closed doors. But when somebody asks you, well, what did you do to stop this? Everything in my power everything that I possibly can. It is not a time for fear. That is the worst, worst choice of actions, fear. An article was written that I read that's in, the, it's in, my, in my briefcase, as a matter of fact. It was in the back of Newsweek. America is made up of cowards and shirkers. In many ways, I would have to agree with that. The argument of the article by the person who originally wrote it states that if you are not willing to stand and fight and stand up for what you own, what you possess, which is a reflection of your life, it's credits accumulated paid to create tangible resource. That tangible resource is a reflection of your efforts. It is your personal possession for it is your time spent. Some enumeration has been created, some transfer has taken place. But if you are not willing to stand for it, and if you do not feel that it is worth the effort to stand for, why should somebody else worry about that property right? Indeed, nobody will. People ask themselves, gee, how did we get into this dilemma? Well, comrade worker, you kind of got what you paid for. Socialism, socialism, socialism. You know what the symbol for socialism is? One of them that I use at work, that's socialism. The other guy's going to do it. I know he is. We paid for it. And it's a round robin in a big circle. As I said at the last meeting, what I like to do when I ask people, the symbol for fascism, swastika, right. It is inevitable that we will fight. Inevitable. I'm telling you this from a military standpoint. It is inevitable that our forces, the people that we are standing against, will use coercive force. And how will I say this? Let's judge it this way. Power corrupts. Absolute power absolutely corrupts. Who is to possess all of the coercive force if the New World Order has its way? One group of people. I suggest you open this up and read it again. 
if you are if you doubt that then you are ignorant or obviously have not read this before because this entire document is a series of checks and balances to put chains upon a government that they knew would go bad that they knew would become corrupt because it is the nature of man to be that way a deal only exists when there are two sides if one side has all the force no deal stands oh and many people think they are the pet puppies in fact i love our enemy the way they've done it we have an elitist mentality that's been fabricated in this country in which there are special people separate from everybody else you will govern over the animals of the earth the peasants oh and by the way you will have supreme power of life and death and you'll have all the food we didn't tell you who they were you left this nice little image here blank and you know what there are enough greedy arrogant selfish people that will put their face into this picture that they have no problem finding the dupes to do their bidding they didn't tell you who the special puppies were consider their own writings the cfr's own magazine stated uncategorically that they wanted to see the population of the planet in approximately 2 billion people january of 1992 by the year 2008 i will rub that in because you are seeing many variations on this considering that we are screaming peace peace we have 150 some wars at present on this planet and they plan on fabricating a few more how can you kill by the year 2008 over 3.5 billion people naturally you can't in the article it stated that through pestilence, war, famine, and other fabricated destructive acts, they will kill billions, not millions. To conceive of the number itself is out of our mind for one reason, one reason only. In 1932, when the harvest of sorrow was at its peak and the American media could have covered it, several hundred, uh, shall we say, uh, leaning reporters went to Russia. They physically watched Russians shot to death for digging acorns out of the snow. Out of the 114 or so reporters who saw this incident, only two actually reported it. Because the glorious social haven known as the uh, Union of Soviet Socialist Republics was the ideal form of government for anybody who had a leftist lean. In the harvest of sorrow that took place over a three and a half year period, 14.5 million Ukrainians starved to death in the breadbasket of Russia. 14.5 million. Imagine walking the distance of the state of Michigan and finding virtually every human soul dead. Every home, every building, every store, every fire station, every city hall, everywhere. They did this three times in Russia and the media did not cover it at all or gave it very little coverage because wink at a nod they were doing the party's bidding an interesting twist if you think that communism is dead for years using the proper techniques and propaganda many people who called Alan Cranston a communist were ridden into the ground well Comrade Gorbachev now is working as the coordinator of base closings in the United States as a director under the Clinton administration. He works out of the Presidio. His number two man presently working for him is Alan Cranston, who is presently working out of the Presidio also. Strange, or is that bedfellows? Maybe the two words go together. Is it an accident? No. Are you conditioned not to think? Yes. Now, I came into this originally back in 1975-76, totally ignorant of any of what we're talking about now. I was well trained as an intelligence analyst and as a counterintelligence coordinator, but first as an intelligence analyst. I never put a name on something I haven't done research on extensively. And in fact, anybody who's dealt with intelligence knows that the first thing that you learn to write is a question mark. Everything is done with verifiers multiple verifiers and still a question mark is left in place because you understand the word counterintelligence 
disinformation. I've come a long trail to get to where I am right now. I am by no means ignorant of my enemy. I worked for the other side. It is that simple. That's a good question. For a period of time, originally when I worked with them, there is a point in time in any career, especially with the military, where you have to choose. Not just the military, but the working circles inside the intelligence fields, etc. You either cut it, leave, or you stay. But if you stay, you progressively sell your soul deeper and deeper into a mechanism that has blackmail cap capabilities. And more and more, you have to give instead of take. You never retire. Well, I have a wife and children. I wasn't raised the way that I was being conditioned, and I thank God for the people who raised me, for my parents. And there was a great decision that I made, and it was important to my wife, and it was important to my family. And I also understood that for a time, and I'll be quite honest, my primary concern was taking care of them, period. Not to talk to people like you, not to talk to anybody. Oh, within my close circles and people that I knew, cl very, very close, people who I relied upon to protect my life, yes. But that's all. But what I've seen is this. Everybody has the same mentality and there's no place to hide. An old gentleman, I'll repeat this every time I speak because it's, it's prophetic. In 1939 and 1940, his family lived in Poland. When the Russians and the Germans came from both directions, he fled Poland. His grandfather took the family out of the country by the skin of their teeth with no personal possessions they left and settled in Chicago. This last January, I met with him when we were talking at a VFW hall. And he came up, and this man is now a grandfather, and he said, Mark, Mark, there's no place left to run. My grandfather left Poland in that way. Where am I to run? If we do not stand and fight now, we will die. For the enemy cannot suffer for someone like me to live if they win. And do you think honestly with 75% of the population to be eliminated as their goal that any of you sitting in this room are going to be allowed to survive? Oh, there will be deals. But remember this, a deal only exists when there are two sides. And none of you are that special. None of you. No status that I see here would buy you out of this faith. Oh, yes, you can sell your family out for a little while. You can get the neighbor's piano next door. With the search and seizure laws right now and the 1-800-screw-your-neighbor, and excuse me, that's the best term I can use, all of these will be checked off the rest of the way. And some of them already are because of that. But in the end... They eat their young. That's a blessing thought for me if I do perish, knowing for a fact that even were they to be victorious using the stooges that they might have, they eat their young. That's good. But they will not win. I've been from one end of the country to the other at one time or another. We've spoken in the last year and a half all over the nation. I have met tens of thousands. Tens and tens of thousands. The most dangerous part right now is that we must hold them back. This would have started even months or perhaps even a year ago. Waco put us this close and most people were ignorant because they are isolated and they are not understanding what is happening amongst the population. And that was the test. Pase Kamatatis was not overridden and yet U.S. military forces were involved. Now, how many are familiar with Posse Comitatus and what it means, power of the county? Good. There are some. Why did you fail miserably? At Lexington and Concord, the only common thought was they are coming to take their property. There were as many diverse and variant organizations, groups, religious factions, whatever, in the United States in 1775 as there are in 1993, despite the propaganda we have received. In one place alone, I've seen 200 independent churches come together, meet, we have talked, and they have gone their separate ways again, signing no agreement, becoming part of no charter, 
and yet with a common mind where they understand the value of this document. The key. The key. The key. All the armies of Asian Europe cannot by force of arms take a drink from the Ohio River nor lay a track on the Appalachian. If this nation is to fail, it shall fail from treachery within and then force of arms from without. It is a fact. That was true in 1865. It was true in 1775. It was true in 1994. This next year will be the telling pitch, the nexus that we are talking about. We are sitting on the brink. You have been tested and you have failed. They now feel, and rightly so, that we are either so blasted stupid or so lazy or so, so wrapped up in beer and pretzels and sports that we are not going to lift a finger to their actions. And I will agree with this, something that most of you do not seem to understand, but I, I want to re remind you of it. When the time comes, out of the 70 million firearms owners that exist, six out of seven at least will hand their weapons over immediately. Immediately. As long as you hold no illusion to that, you'll be doing just fine. That's reality. But let me remind you of numbers using the old world math again. 70 million firearms owners minimum, with 60 million surrendering their arms, means 10 million well-armed combatants. Now, I hate to tell you, kids, but that's just like facing 300,000 screaming naked Chinamen. Worse, because we think a little better, we fight a little better, and we're a hell of a lot better equipped. I pity the fool. I really do. I really do. I've realistically evaluated the situation over the years. Two years ago, if you'd asked me how successful would we be, realistically, the action of this type, having to fight an aggressor of this type on our soil, will cost us 12 years of American history. That's 12 years of my life that I feel is a great waste. For you who are retired, that may be your life. But if you are not willing to pick up the weapon, face this enemy, and look him square in the eye, then you will have failed your ancestors, you will have failed your children, and you will have demonstrated to them that they are right. I will not let this happen. Will any of you? What? No. That's where we have to learn to use our voice again. No. 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 Yeah. Ich nicht verschadet, das ist scheiße. Yeah. That is right. No. Nein. Yes. Who's the estimate? We must learn now to stop them, for they will be a juggernaut, and it will cost us more. I measure not our victory now as being in question. I measure now our victory and how long it will take before we defeat them. Seriously. Have heart. Be strong. Meddle yourself now. Arm yourself for truth. It is time. What can we do? Organize. 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 Always in threes. To organize, your best bet is to do it at the lowest possible level. From the low, we can build up a great wall. But the only way that it can be done is for individuals, individuals to organize. Organize. Squads, fire teams, medical units, we need them all. If you are not interested in picking up an arm, I think that's a wonderful idea. If you have the power of your conviction to believe that, I think that's fantastic. But sure as hell, you better be standing next to me when the time comes. You better put your money where your mouth is. Put your life on the line just like mine. I need a doctor. I need nurses. I need people who are willing to risk their lives to help people who are losing theirs. 
I need educated individuals to help educate the young to make sure that we do not lose the heritage which is the United States, which is this document, the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, so that we properly educate and get through this in one piece. We can sink to the greatest depth and we have. I can't see us getting any lower than we are right now. However, we can also reach the highest summit because we have the best guidelines. As I said before, the United Nations can offer us nothing. The only thing that they can do is take this away. And anybody who claims to abide by their laws is an enemy of mine and an enemy of yours. For to take this from me is to take my birthright away. And it is very important. This is not a chain upon me or any citizen in this room. This is a chain upon the government. For government shall become corrupt. And let me ask you a simple question about the politics of the mechanism that we are facing. Since it will have total power and be the gort of the Day the Earth Stood, stood Still episode, since it's going to be the little gort robot that can wipe out or eradicate anybody who stands up, who will it answer to? That's right. Nobody. And Gort didn't either. Bingo, bango, you're all ash. I do. It has to for one reason, because the only way... Let me ask you this. Here's the best example. Give me your house tonight. Will you? I'll come halfway. I'll take half of it. That makes no difference. We've got a, I, I've got a compromise here. We need a compromise. You're being very unreasonable considering that I want your home. I only want half your home now. You're not going to give me half your home? Do you realize what kind of an inconsiderate this person is? This is an example of capitalism at its, at its thriving at this moment in this country, which should be abolished because we should be self-flailing. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm an American. Oh, my goodness. Here, give me another, give me a cat of nine tails and I'll start it up, okay? That's our, but that's our, pro but that's our problem. This is our problem. Compromise. From the moment the Constitution, that's why the Founding Fathers wrote this the way they did. The Founding Fathers understood that word and what an evil it would become with regards to this. For if I come to you offering nothing and planning on taking something, I guarantee I'm going to eat your lunch eventually. Because I'll come back the first time and we'll be very, I'll, I'll be happy with an eighth of your home. Just give me the property tax that I need. Now that I have the property tax, we'll figure out a way to get you home. Now at some point, we have to decide, and it is now, that it would happen in my lifetime, in your lifetime. I could use that prayer, oh please Lord, don't let it happen to me. But let me ask you this, because this is something with all of you. Will your children be better prepared? They will if we don't do anything. Oh no, they don't. I will... Let me, you hit it right on the nail because this is something I want all of you to understand. I've sat in meetings like this. I've sat in briefings planning some of this. You want to see things, things that would curl your toes? I've watched these people connive and plan to cut this nation up at different times. I've had people, good men, work with me that left the military because of this. At a time when I felt it wasn't right to leave. I've had a lot of good men and women ask me, Mark, shouldn't I leave the military? Let me ask you something. Where would you rather have that person? Within the arm's reach of a rack of M16s or at home? I'd rather have the 20 M16s. And let me tell you this, because to make no mistake about it, make no mistake about it, there are whole army units that are with us. I have spoken to them. 
There are guard units that even now are purging their New World Order crowds, and there aren't many, but there are some, and they are identifying them. And those guard units know who their enemies are. And I've talked to many, and many of you have been, in, been with me when we've spoken to people who have represented those individuals and said, when the orders are given to shoot Americans, we shall turn and we shall execute those traitors that give the orders. We should be proud of those men because, yes, <laughs> it is not revolution. I want this understood, too, because I know the term is what we're coined to, coined to praise. Did I ever say, destroy this document? Never in my life have I said, destroy this document. It is mine, and I am defending it. And you are, and you are, and you are, and all of you are. If you fail to do so, the blood is on your heads for not acting. Because the blood will flow no matter what. The misery will exist no matter what. You're getting a taste of it right now. Shall we talk about Yugoslavia? It was fabricated. Can we talk about Americans dying in Somalia? Quote, unquote, because of ha-ha, poor intelligence. If you believe that garbage, leave now. I worked in the business. The only way that happened is that somebody set U.S. Rangers up to be slaughtered so that you get to see them on primetime television so we could scream, Remember the Maine! and go running off into the desert chasing people who live there, who have a right to be there, who own that property. And like one major said, why don't we just get this all over with and bring Mr. Rockefeller's oil derricks over here right now? The men there know what's going on. We've polluted their minds, too, I'm sure. That, those tapes have gotten everywhere, trust me. We got a lot of recruits with these Ranger units because they've already gotten their butts shut off for no reason, and a lot of them are starting to wake up if they aren't already. They were all told, by the way, that they were pet puppies, too, that they were special, and that nothing would happen to them because they're their pet Doberman. He liked Doberman. You know, they are fun dogs. But we are dumber than puppies, and we can get new puppies all over again. Yeah? That's what they were looking at. We didn't scream off into the desert, remember the name. In some ways, I'll say it's for twofold reasons. Number one, enough Americans have back here in their lumber yard a thought that something is wrong. The other half have been conditioned too well and wouldn't get up out of their chair if you put a crowbar under their ass and tried to pry them out. Let's be honest. They did their training too well. They perverted too many. And in res with respect to that, they couldn't get the response that they wanted. Now, what else do we have in works right now? Well, hang on to your hats, kids. Korea is just around the corner. 800,000 North Koreans have been, shall we say, levied up to the border. U.S. forces are being poured in on a daily basis. A nephew of mine just returned from there uh, rather quickly. His visa was originally blocked to leave Korea, and he is a civilian, not military. The people that he spoke to that he knows that are in the, that are in the uh, military liaison office with the embassy stated that over the last two weeks, up until this next week, there was a 70 to 80 percent probability of war that after this first two weeks, there was a very high probability of war. Our enemy knows how to use the flashing hand, and that's what this is all about. Confusion, confusion, confusion. And he needs a war desperately. Who in their right mind will not support our soldiers in the field? I will support the soldier in the field as, a, as an American soldier. But this is a key, for they are going to go full circle with this ball of wax. Let's twist this around. It's now 40 years ago that we went to Korea the first time. Lost relatives. 57,000 Americans killed in less time than it took to kill them in, in Vietnam. A winter war the likes of which we had not seen before. Anybody who's, who knows the forgotten war knows the misery of Korea and they want us to go back. It's like a CD. They use it, 
They pull it out after a few years. They can put it back in or put it on the shelf. In this case, they pulled it out. They waited 40 years. Time to put the CD back in. We want to play this song one more time. The idea is also a great anniversary. On the coming of the victory of the Iron Fist, they shall demonstrate once again their capability to manipulate this country. And they shall get us into some kind of action somewhere. Korea would help to do two things. Number one, Mr. Rockefeller has taken his resources out of the United States and put them into the Asian rim. In order for Asia to become this superpower we've talked about before, he has to consolidate all of these countries. Whether North Korea comes down and defeats the South, or South Korea comes north and defeats them, it makes no difference because they now need a single Korea with a great pogrom to wipe out one side or the other. That is their social engineering technique. Need I remind you of Vietnam in 1975 or Kampuchea in 1976? Yeah, the killing field. It got rid of the competition real quick. And that's not 20, no, that's 25 years ago. I'd say that's pretty good. We can plug this program back in and people are so foolish that we're going to forget it. It's only a quarter century ago. Pogrom. Purge. We aren't supposed to think about those terms right now. Kefap. There are a thousand different terms for the same technique. Facing one population against another and never getting any of us to do one thing that makes the most sense. Stop and look up 15 degrees to see who's pulling the strings of the other kid. With what they've created in the United States, they're going to do the same thing. Do you not see it now? It is very straightforward. It is very simple. In fact, it's become ridiculously simple, and they're so sloppy now and so crude that I'm amazed. But then again, I will say something. If you want to see just how, how far downhill we've gone, look at the intricacies and complications of the media of the 70s even. And like, take a look at the quality and the conversations that took place that were in the media. Take a look at today's standards and see how far we have sunk. They feel that they have dumbed us down that far, that we are incapable of thinking for ourselves, which in some cases they're doing a good job of trying to condition us into. We have to change that. That gets right back to what I said before about education. The linchpin is this. And I'll keep going back to it whenever I speak from this point on. I, <laughs> I made a mistake and left this in the coat before I left the house, and we had to turn around and go back, okay? Because I do not leave home without it. This is better than American Express and Visa and all the others, trust me. In fact, it's priceless. The original, worth an ocean of blood, a payment that we have to honor, a sacrifice that we may have to make, but one that I am more than willing to if need be. A lot of the Founding Fathers spoke and take this is because not enough of people are thinking about how to use this. Coercive force in the hands of the people prevents tyranny. Tyranny. A word you will learn again and again and again. Oh, they may put a different phrase up. By the way, remember under Orwell's black hole, the memory hole, all of us will disappear. I think an interesting twist to this, and I always want to remind people of it, is if you consider that they planned on doing what they were doing now in 81 and they did not succeed, by an act of God, by the actions of good patriots, some now dead, not because the enemy killed them, but because nature and attrition and the calling of God takes them away from us. We all will pass. But before we do, you must all pass on what you know to somebody else. You had better at least replace your number with one. At least. You are obligated to do so. If you are old, you must seek out and find a person and talk to them and educate them. 
this whole thing, let's, let's talk about something here, the uh, National Death Sentence and National ID Card Program. What do you think that's about? It is a death sentence levied against the American people and our living history books, our citizens. A key to the memory hole that Orwell knew about is to destroy those people who lived the events as quickly and as systematically as possible if the events are not desirable. Is that not what Stalin did with his pogroms or with his purges? Is that not what happened in Kampuchea with the, with the killing field? I can destroy an entire event in their minds. Now they were crude about it, but they're going to be much more systematic and they're going to be very conniving because I can take a young man here. In fact, now, how many people saw it in the paper, they want the one to three-year-old. They're raving about it in the papers. We need to have schools and have the kids in those schools from one to three. Now, you have a kid, and a lot of other people here have kids. What do kids from one to three do? Eat and poop. Okay? play with their trucks and toys, but we can give them the right trucks and toys if we're the government, and they can condition them properly from birth or as close to it as possible. Why else would you want them but to rest them from the grandmothers and the grandfathers who do know the truth because they lived it? You must rest that power away so that the protracted family no longer exists. Hitler Youth, before the Hitler Youth, what was there, though? You know what Joseph Goebbels said? I want you all to remember this, because Goebbels said this in 1936. I have modeled the Hitler Youth after the young Octoberists where Comrade Molotov and Comrade Stalin have built what we hope to accomplish. The young Octoberists were there before the Hitler Youth, and after we ate Germany's lunch, walked through every door, beat down every house, the young Octoberists were still in place and are there today. Isn't it amazing that the illusion that they've been created? Don't think about this, even though it's right in front of you. Don't think about this. Black. I've said this before about the MJTF. We know what the uniform is. We've identified and we had two convoys last Wednesday, 2.35 in the afternoon. By cellular phone, I was informed. 30 vehicles in one column, 20 vehicles in another. Heading westbound on I-94, they were picked up somewhere before, uh, before Battle Creek. They were followed beyond Kalamazoo. All the vehicles were black, no bumper marking, and every man in every vehicle was wearing a black uniform. Long before the SS wore that black uniform, though, somebody else did. Do you all know what the official uniform is of the KGB? Have you ever seen it? It's public information. Well, as of 1918 and even before that, with the Shteka, black was the traditional uniform of the secret police of Russia, period. It always has been. What does black signify? Terror. Terror. How can you people let these monsters creep into our lives? What is the uniform that they are going to, and why are they using the analogy? Black terror. Why the ski mask? I'll tell you why. Geheimstaatspolizei, Schutzenstaffel, Gewest, Stoi, Stoi. A knock at the door at three in the morning. The door opens up. There's fog outside, and the secret police come in. This is the boss, ATF. We're coming in at two in the morning, two in the afternoon. In broad daylight, it makes no difference. With ski masks on, the terror has the same effect. All you see are the eyes of a ruthless man carrying a real machine gun. Trained to kill who? The greatest threat to the New World Order, American citizens. By the way, I hope you have caught on to the way you've been threatened over the last week. Did anybody catch uh, Alan Greenspan's comments about if we do not pass the NAFTA treaty? If you don't pass the NAFTA treaty, all of the stock markets of the planet will collapse, and it'll be on your head. And your head. Good. 
What that was was a direct terror threat against us. Now, what did the President of Mexico say three days ago? Anybody catch it? If you do not pass the NAFTA Treaty in the United States, we will force at gunpoint all of the poor of our nation across and into Texas, Arizona, and New Mexico. How do you like being threatened? You know what? Just about everybody figures they can kick sand in your face and you aren't going to do squat about it. And you know what? They're right. Because the people who are our leaders who were supposed to stop these things have not done so. I'm sorry. Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. Rush Limbaugh. Thank you. Mr. Limbaugh. He isn't going to because... He, the first question I'd have is this. He had, that You should recall with Mr. Limbaugh is that he is on 300 public stations. He is syndicated. Nobody with 300 syndicated stations is going to tell you the truth. Now, what I call him in, plum, in the plumbing field, what we call him is a check valve with a diverter to the left. Number one, his mission is to take free energy and resource, which is what all of us are. You must look at yourself in their formulas. You are a free, explicit, valuable resource. On your own, independent, capable, each one of us is a terrible strength, a terrible force to be reckoned with. Any three of us together, and we're in collusion. Any ten of us together, and we're illegal, I'm sure. Okay? Pretty straightforward. Well, Mr. Limbaugh's mission is to bring us all into a channel. Keep us all on track. Their track. And then once he has us there, give us just enough. Oh, I'll give you a little more. Give you a little more. Oh, yeah. A little more. Here you go. And a little more. Here you go. Oh. Like feeding goldfish or guppies. You know how they come to the surface? Yeah, no. Gives us just enough to keep us happy because we hear some of what we want to hear. Ah, but his mission is like each one of them. There's one specific task. And isn't NAFTA the most wonderful thing that you've ever seen on this planet? Because like he said, well, after all, if we don't go there, the Japanese will. Well, let me ask you something. Is there anything in the NAFTA treaty to stop the Japanese from going there if we drop our borders? No. They still go there, and now they have no tariffs to cross the border. And unlike... Yes. And what happens is this. The borders are open. They can put any plant there they want. The profits go back. And remember, the core profits are the key. Many of these, quote-unquote, multinational organizations right now, remember, have their capitals not in the United States, but in other nations. That's where the key profit goes. The key profit is the investment base that any nation uses. If Japan establishes factories in Mexico or throughout Mexico without restrictions, then what you have is a situation... I'm going to try and find it. I probably won't, so I'm going to be embarrassed here. I'm sorry. But basically, what it says is this. You protect your trades and your manufacturing so that we might have an industrial base to protect this nation from tyranny without and within because George Washington sat down with these men, too. George Washington fought one of the nastiest wars in the history of this nation for two years with no supplies, no support, and what traditionally was what were called bloody footprints in the snow. Men fought with no shoes in the middle of winter. People died never to be found in whole groups, starved to death in the forsaken places of this nation. And when he was done, George Washington understood because we were beholden to another superpower of its day, France. And while we certainly honored our friends for their help, we also understood that they were still a monarchy. And because of that, they could not suffer with that stick in their throat. And one of the keys was to ensure that our patents and that our industrial people, and I don't mean the big industrials, we're talking about manufacturing in general, was maintained so that we would be capable of defending ourselves. You're sitting in the motor capital, oh, I'm sorry, it's not the motor capital anymore. Well, you're sitting in some capital. Well, you're sitting close to Detroit. Well, it's kind of close to Detroit, but Detroit's getting smaller. 
Well, you're sitting pretty close to the city of Detroit. And every day we're losing how many factories? Not just to Mexico, but to Japan or to China, and more so to China. Now, even if you don't believe in all this conspiracy stuff that everybody's always talking about and everybody poo-poo's, especially Rush Limbaugh, who will not let you talk about it at all, by the way, and don't mention New World Order. I've got to bring that in, too. Have you noticed? George, don't mention New World Order on Rush Limbaugh. Isn't that kind of strange? It was, it was George Bush who used it, kid. And it's strange, strangely enough, it's now Bill Clinton who's using it, too. The party on the left is now the party on the right. That's right. The New World Order. Now, may I remind you of something about these industries going to China and going to Japan? Who moved all his money there? Mr. Rockefeller. Who's helping to destroy it? He helped to build the UN. He also created, and I've said this before, but let's do this for the sake of everybody who's not here. Sony, what does it mean? Standard Oil of New York. Mr. Rockefeller created it in 1947. Its mission was to strip the industrial high-tech out of the United States. You're all old enough to remember our favorite little key phrase, you all want a Sony of your own. Okay. In 1947, there weren't many televisions made, but where were they made? Here in the United States. In 1967, Japan was already getting a toehold with the very phrase that I used. That same year, VHS, or a little earlier, VHS or beta systems, were starting to come into popularity to a limited extent. Where were all the VHS heads made at that time? In the United States. Where are all of the VHS heads made now? Japan, and perhaps China, too. What about them? <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Well, the problem is this, what I was, the point I'm trying to make is that every high-tech advantage that we have had has been systematically, through the use of these shadow companies, been taken out of the United States by allowing our patents to be infringed upon in a very legal manner. And once acquired, using dumping techniques, etc., a systematic economic attack took place. Not a myopic little attack by the Japanese, but a systematic attack by individuals whose mission it was to draw the industry out of the United States. Not a two-year plan, not a four-year plan, nothing that short, but a decade, half-century, and century plan. Remember that. Now, did they have a timetable? Yes, they did. As an, and as an intelligence analyst, I'll explain to you very quickly what we call timelines are set up with what you've heard hundreds of times before on the media, windows of opportunity. What a window of opportunity means is that a series of actions are taking place in a convolution of organizations to culminate in a cul-de-sac whereby all of those resources are brought to bear into a focal point. Now, you don't just plan one window of opportunity. Would that not be foolishness if you are trying to endeavor in anything? You create a series of windows of opportunity. And if you're long-term in planning, you stretch these events out so that they appropriately take certain activities and bring them into your sphere of influence. That can be put to military application, that can be put to economic and industrial application, or political application. It makes no difference. What we have done, or forced, and in fact I think been very successful at, is we've been trying to force them to crunch their windows of opportunity. So when I said earlier, isn't it strange how quickly they're working? The reason that this has happened is that by forcing back different activities, example, how many here were involved with the CONCON, Constitutional Convention Amendments? I was. There's some people here who are key to that, though, or are here tonight who were instrumental in this activity, and thank God they were here, or we would be, we'd be in pretty tough shape right now. So they are already trying it, and they have done it in many fronts. But by holding back this CONCON, -con, we have pushed them back in an area. By doing this, we have bunched up another activity, one against the other. NAFTA did not go through as quickly. The crime bill, quote unquote crime bill, in other words, the making Americans criminals bill, where all of us will be criminals for getting together 10 or more, this piled up also. And what has happened now is that a series of activities have culminated in what I said before, is a nexus, a boiling point. You have been successful. 
If you have been involved in this fight, if you have opened your mouth even once, you have been successful. You are doing a, an excellent job. And some of us open our mouth a few more than, <laughs> more than one time. <laughs> For a long time. But we can see the fruits of our labor, even if they will never admit to them. Because in forcing them to do what they are doing now, they must expose and peel away more of the mask. And more of the devil is showing. More of the beast that we are facing is exposed. His true nature. Because they do not want us to think four years down the road. They do not want us to think ten years down the road. What we've done is compress this so that now they must either, as we say, poop or get off the pot. And because of this, they are in a situation where they cannot back down. They cannot back down. Can you imagine the resources that have been spent? Think of what has been faced against you in this country. How much? How much time? Just think of the cost of one minute of media time right now. If you were to turn on Channel 7 or Channel 4, it costs you close to a million dollars for a minute of prime time. And yet how many people here have seen anti-gun articles the likes of which should have been in the editorial page, not in the reporting page? Yeah. How many glorious pro-NAFTA articles have you seen? Calculate the minutes into millions. Calculate the cost of sticking a knife in the right politician here because he was just a tad too curious. Or making sure that another one is properly blackmailed. Or making sure that others are coerced in different ways. Or paying them off. Or bribing them. Or whatever. The numbers are phenomenal. They have taken all of their resources, collected them, and pointed them at this objective. And still, they have not succeeded. Imagine if you will. Think about it. They are scared to death of you as a free citizen. Free energy, free resource. So much so now that they must run with the ball. Run and don't dribble. That's what this is all about. Consider it this way. Just in the next, this next two weeks, they now only have eight to ten real business days in which to finish everything that you've seen in the media, with no confusion, by the way. Have you ever noticed this? I'll give you another example, because, boy, I'm throwing a lot of stuff out here, so let's throw this into the formula, too. If I ask you what's happened in Detroit, and even if you don't live in Detroit, you can pretty well tell me what's happened in downtown Detroit or one of the suburbs over any given day. Even then, it's only a very bare, minimal highlight, and basically dog and pony bread and circus show. But if I ask that same thing, think of it this way. When, when you see something in the media, don't say, what's going on? Ask them, why are they doing this to me? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay? That is a good example, and that's a part of bread and circuses. Back during the, uh, the desert dust operations, when they first started up, when, the, when Iraq went into Kuwait, Nancy can remember this because we I was working at, when I was at work, and I first heard it, and it got a little bit like this. Oh, Iraqi forces were kind of moving into Kuwait. Well, Kuwait's a country. It's not just kind of moving into the neighbor next door. Or it's not like you're going over to visit somebody for a cup of flour. But what was the key and most important event to take place the week following and while that was happening? Jaja Gabor slaps a cop. And it was on the front page of the Free Press, the news, and it was in the New York Times, and it was on the front page. The more frivolous the article that I see, and I will say this to be true, this is one of the gauges that I use, and it was something I was taught. The more frivolous the article on the front page, the more disastrous the event taking place at the time. Remember my hand and what I do with the other one. It's called bread and circuses. In Rome, the technique was used in the exact same manner. Want to go light up some Christians tonight? They're doing it down at the Colosseum. You see? Yes.
disappear and that you would see the opiates rise. Not because it's easy to get the opiates in, but because the opiates are what are needed to down a population. Now let me ask you something, because you're all old enough. I see some gray hair here and some people are in their middle 30s and into their 40s. In the 60s and into the 70s, marijuana was big and a lot of other drugs that were you know, kind of mellowing things. If you had a couch potato with an attitude, okay? You had a few high-speed high drugs that were used, and cocaine was a baby back then. By the way, anybody remember when they said cocaine was not addictive? It's just like marijuana. It's not addictive. Well, we all know what happened then. And it may still not be, quote-unquote, physically addictive, but it's done a good job of sinking its hooks into everybody here, hasn't it? Well, strangely enough, if you look at this from a battle plan, in order for you to commit yourself to the opium war, an opium war technique that was used against the Chinese in the 1800s, they introduced a new family of drugs. And the coca derivatives started to flow into the nation from, again, the soft underbelly of the United States. Now, if somebody told you, asked you where Bogota was in 1965, they'd say it was outside Cincinnati somewhere, and I've been there. It's pretty dull. Okay? Today, most everybody knows that that's Bogota, Colombia, one of the drug king centers, one of the central control points. Well, we also know that at that time, especially with the history books that we do have that are halfway decent, that the Central Intelligence Agency, Defense Intelligence Agency, and other organizations were planting themselves there to take control of certain resources. They created the threat. There is no doubt in my mind that they are bringing, they have brought, and that they are bringing the drugs in. I would, I'd be more than willing to go along with that argument, but I'll go one step farther. The big boys are going to get rid of the cocaine dealers now because we no longer want a hyped up excitable population. What they need now are couch potatoes again. They got what they wanted. They've destroyed a whole generation of minds because the technology is gone. The knowledge of how to has been taken from a 20 year block of people and thrown out the window. Did we replace the skilled laborers that we needed to replace in the 70s and 80s? No. Did we replace the technicians and the people who knew how to make things work? No. Have we taken the manufacturing out of the nation? Yes. Well, now that we've gotten this far and we've got this big downer going where everybody's not supposed to react in any positive way, we're supposed to implode. We're supposed to go in on ourselves and start to, you know, mope and pull out the old sob rags and cry, and then, well, we've got to find some way to feel better, so we're going to look for a drug. Cocaine's not going to be available, but the opium will be. Opium dens. A great way to deal with the population. Not just opium dens, you can use a variety of techniques, but it'll come down to the opiates are the excellent tool for the population groups involved. It'll bring them down, it'll put them on the shelf. There'll still be enough crime so that this massive national police force can be used, and cocaine will be brushed aside when they decide to get rid of it, just like swatting a bug. But right now, they're in the transition phase. Now, I'll remind you of something. Back when the Iraq War took place, I asked people this. Yeah, we cut off the oil. Did we cut off the legal and illegal uh, trade in opium coming out of the opium poppy fields of Iraq, Iran, Turkey, and Afghanistan? No. Who owns most of those fields? The House of Windsor alias the Queen of England now, because she's queen, so she's the one who gets to be the top cookie. But it's the, the House of Windsor who is, was heavily invested in these opium poppy fields when they originally targeted the Republic of China in the 1800s. When they employed them against China, they went into the three southern provinces of China and created what are called the Opium Wars. What they did is they introduced a drug that did not exist in China and when it was, it became the same problem that we see in the United States now. Now, I'll go a little farther back, because there's something very interesting. If you ever get into history, and boy, I'm a history nut. During the Aztec and the Mayan eras, massive stone carvings were generated. One of the key ritualistic tools used were the, op were the uh, coca drugs available at the time. Progressively, it became a high art form, and then at some point, they started to collapse and they fell farther and farther within themselves. And eventually, they lost the technology, they lost the artisans. There's no great work that survived to demonstrate 
who they were and what happened. Can we speculate? Well, the stone carvings tell us a great deal about what they were involved with and what took place. Has history repeated itself? Most assuredly, yes. Can we get out of it? Well, there are two ways that this can happen and we can get out of it. This particular aspect. With this, as a shining beacon, as a guideline, we can dig ourselves out of this trench. We can. But there are three legs to the tripod that we have to stand on. God, family, and country. Lose any one of them and the tripod falls. Take one of the legs on any of these cameras and you'll find out real quick. Our enemy understood this. The family will be owned by the government. God in their eyes will cease to exist. And countries shall be dissolved. From the three fingers to the fifth. You see how it works? We can get out of it, but we have to either do one of two things here now. Accelerate the circle of, of activity that takes place, the natural series of circular cycles, and kick ourselves through a couple of them and get back to liberty. Or we fight tooth and nail and don't worry about the ark but go straight to liberty. Either one's going to be expensive. Either one's going to cost us a great deal. One would be preferred over the other. I really don't want to spend any time being a slave, and I certainly will not curse my children with that. So I got this funny feeling we're going to be sorely pressed to take the straight line and be done with it. Yes? That's okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, the question is that uh, when will be the time? When will be the time that we fight? And if I... If I were to say this, if I'd started this, I've seen this happen before. Everybody's asking the same question. Everybody asked that question eight months ago. When is the time to fight? I was lulled into idiocy once. I will, in all cases, in, in fact, let's, let's use a basic model you should repeat to yourself a hundred times over. In cases of natural disaster and man-made catastrophe, the majority is always wrong. Remember that. And that is the key. Wait just a minute. The reason I say this is because even as we are screaming, most assuredly, we are not the full majority as most people like to interpret. But I, as I've said before, we are the vocal element of a majority that is out there. Now, there's a few that are trying to sit on the fence, and as I said before, there are no deals. So they will learn the hard way, and they will get the pen. I'll give them the sharpened pen or the butter knife, and they can go out in front of me because I need more organic sandbags. Okay? you got your opportunity right now. You're all free citizens. You already get to make your decision right now. If they haven't made it plain, if they have not made it plain that they want your weapons, then I don't know how they can. And the weapons are the key because it is still in the back of their mind. They know they put their pants on just like you and me. They button their blouses just like you and me. And because of that, there is still that niche of fear back here. Now, I will say one thing that I have not said yet tonight that I will remind you of. Why have they gotten so far? Because they no longer fear the American vote. They no longer fear the American vote. In times past, for just a small portion of the crime that has been committed by these people, these men would neither be alive, nor would they be allowed to even stand on the same piece of soil that I stand on. We have been suffered and created in the image of the people we left behind in Europe, in Asia, and in every nation that our good citizenry left. Let's put it this way. I like what they said in stripes. Oh, come on. Y'all like old yeller. Why are y'all here? Because you were kicked out of all the respectable nations on the planet. Well, that's true. Oh, and now some of us didn't get kicked out. We chose to leave. 
And I have a personal belief in this, that it takes a very different soul to make the decision that with whatever creature comforts you have, you pick up, you leave to a question mark halfway around the world, and that you set yourself down and you make the effort to become a free citizen. That is a different psyche. That's a different, I think, gene makeup and everything. I believe it is a totally different kind of person that it takes. Imagine the strain we've put on all these other population groups because every time that we've done this, from the nations that we've received, great citizens, we have left behind the others. And they have lost that spark. Our enemy knows this too. I've said this before and I'll say it again. One thing to remember. I'll take any ten of the worst soldiers I can find in the United States and pit them against any company of foreign infantry. And I pity the fools when they show up. I really do. I don't care if they're European. I don't care if they're Asian. I don't care if they're in South America. Our enemy knows this now too. He thinks that what he's done, you'll notice something. It's not that the enemy has raised up or elevated anybody else to any better standing. They haven't. What they believe they've done is they've cut the slats off from underneath us and dragged us down so low that we can't stand on our own feet. Well, I'm here to tell you that Daddy didn't raise no fool. And that's why I own this. And that's why I own that. And a lot more like them and as many as I can. Because when the time comes, the spark is still alive in me. And I plan on making sure it's a blazing bonfire in my children. Don't you think it should be that way? Yeah. Now, when do we fight? There will be no more Wacos. But there will be an attempt for another one. There will be a terrible action. I, ter I personally believe this. I believe that the next action, though, will make Waco appear as a pleasant dream. That it will be fast, that it will be devastating, and that they will cover it, but for a far different reason. Because the only hope that they have is terror. A lot of you say, oh, they won't try that again. Why won't they try that again? They'll get away with it. They'll, if you give me an inch, if, if you're with the Fed, they'll give, you give them an inch, they're going to take two miles. They already, I mean, what's, what's more apparent? And I know there are people debating Linda Thompson's tape even, they're trying to now, and I want to address that real quick. Ignore fighting amongst yourselves. Focus on the enemy. Ignore his attempts to divide us in any way, shape, or form. Ignore any diversions. Attack, attack, attack. George Patton had the right idea. Because when you start having these people throw these smoke screens up, you know we've hit pay dirt and we're on the mark and we're doing damage and hurting them now. And with this situation, with this next, with this next Parawaco incident, you will see, for instance, mechanized forces immediately on the scene. You will see air mobile operations given extensive coverage with a successful action, even if they have to fabricate it with other footage. They will not admit to their losses. Need I remind you of the activities in Desert Dust to psychologically brainwash us concerning the conditions and outcome of the war? And I've heard all these bright young people tell me, well, they'll never fool us again. He ain't gonna be like Vietnam. Oh, they'd never lie to us. We'll know everything that's going on. A year and a half later, more and more comes out. We find out more and more about what I said during the war and a lot of people laughed at are is coming to light. Logic dictates. You fly something into a bullet screen, you're going to collect bullets because planes are bullet magnets. That simple. Anybody who's been in an aircraft knows this. So you fly low enough, somebody's going to find you and put holes in you. And contrary to all the propaganda, yeah, it was a great air war. We did a fine job, killed a lot of civilians, took down the population for Saddam, created a lot of building programs for him to help lift him up, and in the process didn't touch him. See? With our own activities, we are going to fight, we are going to be successful, but you are not going to get any credit for what you do. If you expect that thing to be in support of us in any way, shape, or form, it just isn't going to happen. The boob tube is controlled. So, that's right. The Federal Reserve controls that and the people overseas, foreign powers. So when the actions take place, it will probably start, for instance, in a regional sense in their respect. 
What will happen is, in the initial activity, an engagement will take place, possibly against a well-fortified position, not a small location. There are several targets. There's been speculations about Wyoming and other parts of the country. It is possible. When it takes place, at first, there will not be much information getting out of the area. But what will happen is, like Lexington and Concord, people will see the smoke. This is all that will take from that point on. Remember, when they engaged at Lexington, only 18 to 22 men, there's a, really a, there's a, there, there's a, a charter sh stating which men stood. Those men stood in the face of a wave of British military. Not an equal force standing across the battlefield. They stood up in face of overwhelming odds, knowing full well that if the enemy were to engage, he would sweep them from the battlefield. And he did. Lexington was our first loss of the war. Concord was next in line, and with the British having tasted blood, they went on. I will remind you again that the British commander went to the center of the town, had his soldiers pull a lounge chair out so that he could watch the activity, sat down in the square with his MJTF uniform on, with his Hessian uniform on, and watched his black suited, I mean red suited soldiers, go house to house and burn systematically. When that happened, everybody saw the smoke from Concord. 10,000 minimum, 10,000 American soldiers, Minutemen, militia men, men with the assault weapons of the day, stepped forward and turned the road back to Boston into a bloody red carpet. Now, that's what we need. If need be, some of us will, and many are prepared. We have our own example, for instance, our own situation here. If that were to take place in Wyoming, you would already see telegraphed actions taking place, and we're seeing, we're getting many reports from people all over the country this week. The biggest problem I have is trying to do work when I'm at work. Right. To, to see what they are seeing here is totally repugnant. These are patriotic, God-fearing soldiers who have sworn allegiance to the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. They take their oath most seriously. For a foreign soldier to lay boot upon American soil is the ultimate of sacrilege. To do it like they did at Waco on the 19th of April, the anniversary of Lexington Concord, was a slap, not a shot heard around the world was a terrible sin against this document because it was the full force of part of the British Empire returning to kill American citizens on our soil. And common law, and, and not common law that prevailed, but that rag that we had in here, forgive me, it was an American flag, but it has been besmirched because of that gold trim that was on it. That is not my flag. I bend no knee to any crown, to any king, to any queen, no monarch, no position of authority that claims any title of nobility. And for you to do so is a great sin. Boy, Mark, that's awfully heavy. Yes. We talked about this today. I was on a phone conversation with a friend of mine who works in the, in the next building. And he goes, and I, I asked him this, I said, can you imagine if we had the founding fathers for 24 hours alive right now could you imagine the Founding Fathers standing? Or, as Jefferson said, pull out your pistols and fire and reload. And I'd like to have Jefferson standing here right now. Because he always said, keep your pistols close to your breast. And he didn't mean home in the closet. Yeah, cocked and locked and ready to go. And that's what we failed in. Okay, I'm going to take some questions real quickly. The gentleman here has been very patient, so I'm going to ask him, please. Markers, we have pictures here tonight. 
And in fact, if we could, there's a packet back with my briefcase that has duplicates of the original color photos taken out of Indiana where patriots had already done some work that when these stickers showed up on the oncoming signs, the backs of oncoming traffic signs, they showed up all at once throughout different parts of the state. Uh, Michigan Department of Transportation. Okay, now these, now what they, what happened is these stickers, originally most people were looking and go, ah, kids are, there's some vandals out there, some kids. The stickers are approximately half the size of this, this packet right here. They are in base, three basic colors, but there are other colors that are used. Red, green, and blue. I'm sorry, yes, red, green, and blue. Yellow is also used. And we're finding some other off colors that are used. In Indiana, the mar roads are now more effectively marked with numbers and a color sticker. The numbers denote priority, but what we can interpret, of targets along these particular roads. A higher number denotes a, an industrial base site of some type, like a factory, a stamping plant, or whatever. High numbers also indicate all grain elevators and mills. Low numbers, such as zero or one, indicate, for instance, dirt county roads or private domiciles. Now, how would this work, people ask? Well, what would you put these stickers on here for? Well, I'm Comrade Kalunovich, and I'm with the 16th Guards Tanks Army, and I've been brought into the United Nations Authority in my little black uniform. I speak about 10 light words in English, but I've been well conditioned to understand what colors mean. I have my three five-ton trucks. I have been going with my long list built up by, of course, the U.S. Directorate of Central Law Enforcement. Under Gore's re reorganization plan, the Directorate for Central Law Enforcement is the CIA, FBI, DEA, ATF, federal marshals, and everybody else in one KGB, I mean National Police Force. Yeah. Learn the three letters most important because KGB will change too. Just a minute. The, the thing that I can see about this is Comrade uh, Kolunovich goes, no, oh, gee, okay, we pick up this guy. Okay, we got 40 people in this truck. He picks up his handy daddy uh, uh, communications link and goes, route north, and then he gives a mile marker because there's a mile marker indicator. Red route, pick up one truck, red smoke. Goes over to the side of the road, pops his red smoke throws it out, a Chinook or a heavy lift helicopter comes in, lands, picks up the accumulated prisoners, and there's no threat of those prisoners ever being recovered because they go directly into the camps and land. That's the easiest way to do it. Now, what appeared in most of Indiana, Indiana and is in almost every small and large town now is a marker at the center of town, which is about so, in fact, it's the size of this, blue and white, has a zero on it. As you go north, south, east, or west, the mile markers are there. One mile no north or south or east or west route. These would indicate, as with ground zero, specific control areas, how to grid off the local area under your control if you were a regional military commander or with the guard under the MJTF or with foreign forces under FinCEN. And the markers are not in Indiana now. They're not only in Indiana. They're in Michigan, they're in Ohio, and they're in virtually every state in Region 5, which is what you're in right now. Yes? rifles taken? I did. Did you watch them beg not to have the pump shotguns taken? I did on C-SPAN. Did anybody watch them beg not to have the demilitarized weapons taken? In other words, weapons that aren't even functional? I did. They asked for, a, for resolutions to exempt all of these arms. What does that tell you? That tells you that in the crime bill they asked for the whole house and you only gave them half. So we don't know what they gave them. The crime bill is written like the, like, the, like the national death sentence plan and is written the same as NAFTA. 
It, in fact, is, a, is an exact, we said this before, remember, California is the litmus for what they would do to the United States? Well, for anybody who doesn't remember what they did in California, everybody thought they'd make a deal. But the state's attorney general has the authority to ban any weapon at her or his discretion. What happened is they went for the House. We want a hundred and some weapons banned. Oh, God, don't take my gun. Take that son of a bugger over there and take his gun. And everybody said, oh, okay, yeah, well, we won't take your gun. We'll take his. You just go along with what we say. And you know what? They were stupid enough to do it. And 48 hours after they passed the law, every weapon that they took off the list was right back on the list. A deal only exists when there are two sides. Apology accepted. Yes. had people go and follow the roads. We have Patriot elements, of course, all through the country. We spread the word and ask them to take a tally of where and what roads are affected. Now, we had people at the last meeting who have already gone through that area and went through the roads specifically to identify them. I will say this. Remember, excuse me, we think that some of these markers are, they do not necessarily affect the whole road. Some of the markers right now are simply for either daylight or night observation to mark how to get on the ground. <coughs> Cloud seeding is something that it's either being done to control the weather, and again, uh, if you tried to sell this to me in 1980-81, then heaven help you, you'd be starving right now. But as I've been better educated, and even though we knew that the technique was possibly available, we have photographic evidence that some activity of that type took place approximately three to four weeks ago. <coughs> I will remind you that uh, viral, uh, viral infections, <coughs> I'm hearing a lot of coughing right here, seem to be hanging on quite well and are not effectively combated. What's happening? We don't know. However, it was claimed by people who identified this action in some area that they observed planes of the type that we had watched before. <coughs> that these planes flew in a solid line formation, atomized the area, the vapor trails dispersed, but did not dissipate, in fact thickened. And in the, both the videotape and the footage that we have, up to 40 aircraft were involved in one column alone. So it was a coordinated air activity of some type. Now, are there any other questions? Yes. I don't know. Now, I will, now, there's one thing. He has gotten hold of a lot of, although one package was sent back and opened, and I understand a lot of people have had this happen. I've been on Mark Scott quite a bit, in many cases just as a general call-in over the years. And during Desert Storm, I called in quite a bit also. So I, we've, been, we've talked about this before. And other things. Uh, it was at this site when I originally offered him everything that I had, and he had no interest, though, at the time. And he did bring that up the last time he spoke about it, but I don't believe that he recalled it until somebody jogged his memory. In fact, two of his bodyguards, I believe, were there, and, and I was the very last, or one of the last seven people to be at the meeting that took place here. That was a tax protester meeting. I have a tendency to stay to the very last, as everybody knows. I'm a very patient slug, okay? That's why I said, when we talk about 10-year war, you better be patient. You better have the tenacity of a, uh, of a uh, pit bull with a lockjaw. Uh, this person, then, go ahead. back in 1981 or 80 with the Quebec question. Quebec is coming up as a problem again. Have you noticed this? Remember how they orchestrate events. The common market is still bound to honor any contractual arrangements made by any of its signatories over the last 10 to 15 years. When Quebec was trying to secede or was making rumblings about ceding from uh, Canada, France offered direct military support to establish Canada as a military power, uh, Quebec as a military power. 
There are rumblings again about Quebec in be, being coming independent. This would be a very good diversion, considering the situations that are taking place right now, and would create an equitable trade because most of the fabricated wars that they've used recently, which are all small, what we call pimple wars. Have you noticed that? You don't worry about your naval or marine forces being threatened. In fact, you have you can move with impunity. Well, Quebec would be a nice out-of-the-way action. It would decimate a population that they want to thin out. Not my eyes. These are their visions. It would destroy some of the civil population centers that they have already evacuated to a limited extent. Remember, Canada has a forced uh, reorganization policy for many of its smaller towns, and they've actually shut them down. They are already socialist. Everybody seems to forget that. So this would be a nice out-of-the-way brush war. Just far enough into the wilderness we could almost drive to it and take pictures, and at night we could watch the rumblings of the artillery from Michigan. It would be very entertaining for them. There, here. About um, Lynn, Lynn Thompson's tape, you were going to make a comment about it. Oh, Lynn Thompson's tape. Okay, yes. And this is, the other point was about if NASA goes through tomorrow or not, how that ties into the... Okay, we did. We touched on it, but the one question is this: Will that go through? Okay, I'm going to put my my proverbial money where my mouth is. There are two options to this action, but I smell a big greasy skunk here. I would not be surprised with the way they're keeping score in the media that we have another convenient tie vote. And how do we decide tie votes? They will try. They will try then they have to go through the side. But they're, remember, he's already talked about reorganization. They got most... Now, wait a minute. I, this brings up something. Hold on for just a moment. Something I want to remind everybody of. How did they get the crime bill and the gun control bill through the House? By special directive, contrary to congressional law. Do you all understand how that works? In other words, it's there, but it's not there. There's a guideline, but they use it okay now the other thing is this I haven't found very many Americans who are in favor of NAFTA and in fact even in the, with the people who are voting for it there is an overwhelming negative attitude like the last tax hike that you had they ignored us so do not be surprised at what you see tomorrow I think it'll be expected last but not least whoops one more Linda Thompson I'm sorry one thing to remember, Linda Thompson generated a product, a product that was successful in moving millions of people. I will say this, were it not for the work that she has done, most people would still be sitting on their hind end in the political arena. The only reason, the only reason, and I'll tell you this because I watched all the news conferences, the only reason that the ATF and the FBI and all the other dog and circus people came in and did the piece that they did on television is because of that tape. And they, I'm serious. It was asked three different times in three different sessions, what about that tape that's floating around America, that one about Waco? Oh, you know, they would talk. They wouldn't even talk about it. Oh, don't worry about that. Now, if that's a response, I, I'm, excuse me, I'll show you some swamp land. What had happened and what is happening is what we are calling the woodchuck wars. That's exactly what this is. We have gone underground and ignored the general media and gone to the people. And when it goes out, it's like we had a, our tapes went out to Wyoming. They come up, they go boom. The little bomblets drop everywhere. And like a woodchuck, it goes back underground, and I don't know where it's going next. It's gone to Seattle, it's gone to Wyoming, it's gone to Nebraska, it goes to Albuquerque, New Mexico. Linda Thompson's tape did the same thing. There was a nagging question, because even for the ones who were enjoying the bread and circus that was uh, put before them and got to rerun constantly on television and watch those people burn to death, Everybody still had this nagging problem with this because even though they're confused, they're still not totally polluted by the other side. And it did what it was supposed to do. That's what I've been saying. That's why we've done the tapes that we did. Like I said earlier, the reason I came forward, you have an interesting question, I'll tell you why. The reason I came forward and started doing what I'm doing now is because, excuse me, nobody else was doing it this way. Everybody else was, well, you get ready for way down the road. Come to the, you know, come to the meeting and fall asleep. The problem is this. 
Uh, human nature is such that if you do not say and tell, tell people flat out and shock them a little, which intentionally, in my, that's my mission here, is to wake people up, okay? If you do not do that, I guarantee that people will go back, sit down on their lazy hind ends, and not respond to this threat until it's here or until it's behind them, passed right over them. Isn't that what's happening right now with a good portion of our people? We've had, that's right, it's like a blitzkrieg. It's over, they've overrun the position, they're past us, they're, they're, they're encircling us and getting us ready, putting us in little cul-de-sacs to finish us off. That's exactly what's happening right now. And if we do not stand up, then we are committing a grievous sin. And I believe as Christians, if you do not stand up, you are committing a grievous sin. You are responsible. If you are not going to be the good shepherd, who will be? If you do not take care of the sheep that are astray, yes, we have to save souls, but we are committed to this temporal action here. If you don't do it, nobody will. Well, some people will eat the sheep, but it has nothing to do with being a shepherd. Yes. Why is No, 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 no. I'll tell you what. It's really, you, you have the right idea. Because what we're doing, okay, instead of us, okay, instead, ask for the law. Why? Because they have to respond to you. They can't just take the letter and go and throw it out the door. They have to take that letter and figure out how to either fool you or how to throw you off, off the track and out of the way. And if you're persistent, they are forced to demonstrate that they're violating this. And that's the key. And that's the best thing to do. Now, exactly. Yes. Oh, yes, we have to, okay, we have to go. One other little suggestion before, just one more. See this rope? If I cut an inch off every piece, if I cut an inch off this rope and do several inches, these things fit so nicely into an envelope. And a copy of our sedition and treason laws should be in the envelope with this. This is not a threat. This is a promise. Okay? Now last... Last but not least, and we never fail to do this, God bless the Republic. Death to the New World Order. We shall prevail.